I just recorded the entire video. And then I went to stop the recording and it started recording. <sighs> I've been I've been doing I've been doing this for like I've been doing this for 10 years. I should this is not a thing that should still happen to me. You are recording, right? We're doing this again. Hello, humans. My name is Dale Kingsmill, and I have been whew, in my thoughts. I've seen several people recently discussing what makes a good tabletop player. And I know I usually make videos from the perspective of the person running the game, but I actually, I don't want to talk about, you know, how to please your game master or what, what a game master likes in their players. What I want to talk about is how to play for yourself. If, if you want to engage more closely with the game as your character, how do we make that a bit easier, a bit more fun and less frustrating? Straight up, I, I will admit to you right now that I think I am a medium fine player. Like I'm not the best, but I go all right. And this is great news for any of you out there who are self-conscious about it, because I have somehow also tricked a lot of other people into thinking I'm actually really good. <sighs> As an example, uh, a couple of years back I was playing in a campaign Matt Colville accidentally ended up running called Dusk. It was great. I miss it every day. I recommend starting from episode 3, but the whole thing is available on YouTube. Anyway, at one point my character was separated from the pack lost in a shadowy mirror dimension, alone. And so Matt and I played a session with just the two of us. I remember being so stressed, even through all the fun, because I knew that there weren't gonna be other players there to lean on and to help disguise my faults. And I did come out the other end of that session feeling like I had done kind of a rubbish job. Or at least like I hadn't done my best. And I, I still feel that way when I watch it back. But there are all these comments complimenting my role playing. So I guess I got away with it. So so these are my tips to fake it till you make it. Role playing for dummies. Let's heck and go. Wait, 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 wait. What's that? What is that? That that lack of annoying ads playing on the video. What is that? Oh, yeah, today's video was sponsored by Accidental Cyclops and their Kickstarter for Surviving Strange Hollow, which <laughs> I happen to be writing on. What they've done is they've covered the cost of the ad revenue that I would usually get from YouTube for this video, so you and I can relax and enjoy the unmonetized serenity. Ooh, ah. Thanks, Strange Hollow. The link to the Kickstarter is in the description below. All right, let's, uh, let's squash this. Watermelon. I don't even know what idiom I am trying to remember right now. These are basically all going to be things that I have at some point realized I'm not very good at. And so then I deliberately decided to improve at them. This is Dale's guide to being slightly better at roleplaying than you were at roleplaying before. Lesson the first, part of why I got away with being a kind of mediocre player in the Solo Dust game was that it is never a solo game. I thought there weren't going to be any other players to lean on during that session, but of course, the GM is a player too. Any time I got particularly boring or off track, Matt did or asked something that would drag us back into the realm of good storytelling, because the GM and the other players want the story to be good as well. They are on your side, and that team aspect, that bouncing offiness is so helpful if you want to roleplay. I think that the very best thing that you can learn as a player is what we call in acting active listening. In my opinion, it's the common thing between great actors and great improvisers that makes them great players. It's easy to think, oh, that person's good at playing because they're an improv or because they're an actor. But someone can be super intelligent or funny or a master of voices, but it isn't going to necessarily translate into being a good player unless they also know how to stop overthinking and observing themselves and start paying attention to what other people are doing at the table. If I were to simplify it, I'd say it's about keeping your eyes peeled for offers from other players and just being ready to engage with them. Your GM in particular is going to be making constant offers. You hear a floorboard creak down the other end of the dark, spooky hallway. Like, of course you know that that way lies danger, but that's also the GM telling you 
that they have a story for you. You don't always have to completely yes and every single offer, but just as long as you're not completely ignoring the bid entirely, I think you're probably going to get better results. Maybe you aren't willing to creep down the spooky hallway alone in the dead of night, but you might wake someone else up to come investigate with you, or you might uh, set up an alarm and pretend to fall asleep and see what happens. The GM made an offer, and you made a counter offer. But now we're cooking. The other players as well are going to be saying and doing all sorts of things that, if you're paying attention, can be great opportunities for character moments, and, and they might not even realize that they're doing it. So you gotta be listening, you gotta be ready. Lesson number two! <sighs> Something that I think comes uh, naturally to a lot of newbie role players is to choose character over mechanics. Your priorities get a little skewed by good intentions. You say, yes, my core class stat is mechanically dexterity, but I see my character as being very charming and smart, so I'm putting my highest ability score into charisma and my second highest into intelligence instead, and I'll take just a plus one to dex. I see it happen especially with physical stats being dumped for social, because you can't really roleplay constitution, you know? So the instinct makes a lot of sense, but to me the next level up in roleplay is Rather than sacrificing mechanical advantages for the sake of role-playing, you want to think about how you can marry mechanics with the story that you want to tell. Because if you think about it, very rarely is part of your character's story intended to be, I'm a sharpshooter, but I suck at it, right? You actually end up harming the narrative by hampering yourself. So when you want to play something that's a little bit more detailed or different than the expected ability spread, and you have to sacrifice some mechanical benefit to achieve it, just try to make sure that you're thinking about what deficiencies will add to the fun, to the story, to the character, rather than deficiencies that end up making you functionally clunky. And there's usually another option available to you, especially in D&D where you can use feats or ancestry bonuses or skill proficiencies, lots of different stuff to achieve what you're looking to achieve character-wise without sacrificing so much of the function. Number three, this one has bitten me in the butt so many times, it is, it is a tough habit to kick. The secret to secret keeping is that you actually have to tell people the secret. Let me explain. Part of the fun for a lot of long-term characters is when they have some element of their past that they want to keep to themselves. I, I completely agree with that. So naturally, as human players, when something related to that secret comes up in the game, we want to keep it to ourselves. It's a secret. Of course we do, that's what secret means. But I ask, does successfully never revealing your past to the other characters make for a good story? Does it contribute to the found family dynamics? Does it develop bonds of trust between these disparate rat catchers thrown together by fate? No, no, it does not. When the game master hands you a gift that is the officer of the law who's been hunting you down all these years, but you changed your identity and now he's showed up at the ball but he doesn't recognize you just yet, you gotta unwrap that gift. You gotta. A neat trick if you really can't come up with a reason for your character to willingly reveal their secret, but you as a player know that this is a great opportunity for it, you as a player can describe how your character is acting, like from a third person perspective. Hey, uh, what's everybody's passive insight? Okay, so most of you don't notice, but Sky and Wraith both clock that my character is suddenly really tense. She keeps reaching for where her sword would usually be sheathed, and she flat out refuses to face the side of the room where Officer Bobby is standing. Now you've given them a hint that you want these other characters to inquire, to get the information out of you without having to misrepresent your character in the story. The important thing is that you should share your secrets. Actually, think of Alice is Missing. At the beginning of Alice is Missing, all the characters start with a secret, but it's part of the rules that you have to reveal that secret before the game ends. You have to share your secret before the end of the game because that's where the drama lives, that's where the juice is at. <laughs> It's, it's me, it's me sucking the juice out of it. <laughs> if you never share your secrets, they just become narrative dead ends. And I think that's a real shame. Numero cuatro? I never took Spanish. Uno, dos, tres, cuatro, cinco, cinco, seis. Yeah, I feel confident in cuatro. Numero cuatro, ask 
questions. Yes, I do mean to your GM so you can build a clearer understanding of the situation your character is in, but most importantly I mean be a person who asks questions in character of the other characters. Because that's how you give the other players the opportunity to share their cool backstory. If Sky and Wraith clock your shifty behavior at the ball but never ask about it, what's even the point? I know that we don't want to feel like we're interrogating the other players and you don't always have to act on something immediately, but this goes back to active listening again. When someone hints to you that there's a deeper character element at play, they're making an offer. It's a, it's a little bid. Hey, aren't I so suspicious around this specific cup? Doesn't that just make you go, ooh? If it doesn't feel like the right time or if you don't want to bring it up in front of the whole party, flag it for later. Say something like, Sky looks at you curiously for a moment, but she doesn't say anything just yet. That way the player knows that you've picked up what they're putting down and then you can circle back to it later when it feels like circumstances are more of a fit. If you're really worried that the other player doesn't actually want you to needle the truth out of their character, you can literally just pass them a note asking. This isn't a high school maths, you, you won't get in trouble for that. Communication is good. And questions are great as a general tool for introducing roleplay opportunities too. I'm a huge proponent of campfire debriefs. Two characters are on watch, one of them asks the other about recent adventuring events that they experienced. Wow, gee willikers, say that five times fast. So you nearly died in that vampire fight, huh? How does that make you feel? Just offer them a moment to reflect on where their character is at. It makes a world of difference. I, I realize that this advice is more about how you can help make role-playing easier for other people than it is actually about making role-play easier for yourself. But imagine, and just imagine the power of a whole player party who all asked each other questions. My God! Number five, the Dungeon Dudes made a video recently where they pointed out the difference between character motivations and character traits. And I think that it's it's just such a valuable observation. Character motivations are good. I mean, you know, vengeance, glory, riches. I like to give my characters motivations by thinking of them as a chip on the shoulder. My characters always have something to prove, whether it's to themselves, their family, their god, society at large, whoever. Prove that you're the very best, like no one ever was. Prove that you don't need anybody, that you're just fine on your own. Prove that you can be the perfect, well-behaved heir. Motivations can be really helpful things to understand about your character, but they don't immediately translate into action. Character traits, on the other hand, are like the symptoms of their motivations. They are things that drive you into action. So if you want to make playing a character easy, look to give them some character traits that you can draw on. An incessant curiosity that means you just have to see what's behind every locked door. A determination never to look like a coward so they'll never back down from a challenge or from a fight. An obedience that means that they do not question orders from someone that they see as being above them. Think about how the character's motivations manifest. Then you can give yourself a couple of shorthand habits to fall back on. A character I played comes to mind, he was a researcher that was slowly turning into a dragon monster. Think lizard from Spider-Man but history instead of science. So his whole motivation was this desperation to reverse his curse. I need to prove that I'm not a mindless beast. So his character trait was a ridiculous verbosity. He always used the biggest, fanciest word for what he meant, even when a short or a simple one would do. Just to be sure, I kept a list of good pretentious sounding phrases in front of me as a security blanket that I could fall back on if I needed to. Side note, take advantage of traits to show character development over long campaigns. It's such a neat trick. If your character is always getting themselves into trouble because they're too nosy for their own good, then when they almost die setting off a trap they didn't notice, you can use that as a trigger to start to play them differently. That experience changed them and now they all always stick close to a buddy and refuse to do anything alone. So not only do character traits make role playing a little bit easier, they actually can end up transforming a light gimmick into genuine character depth, which is pretty dope to watch unfold. Again, all of these advices are things that I genuinely find difficult, but I'm trying to work on them. And I genuinely think the more effort I put in, the more I practice 
being aware of these things and employing these things, the better I get and the better the story gets in connection with it. The lack of ads, once again, is thanks to a sponsorship by Surviving Strange Hollow. It's an RPG setting based on the absolutely gorgeous art of Emily Hare, and it's one which I and many other familiar names happen to be writing for. The Kickstarter is going to be running until the 5th of April, I believe. It launched while I was asleep and it funded before I even woke up. There's a link in the description if you want to go take a look for yourselves. I think it's going to be pretty cool. I hope that you found something helpful in these tips. My name is Dale Kingsmill and you can find me all over the internet. Those links are in the description also. Uh, apart from that, I do believe that's it. I'm done. Email this to your grandmother and I will see you some other time. Oh God. <laughs>